give the floor to the question that immediately arises out of this analysis, which is, so what is the impact of our groundwater pumping for irrigation, which is going into the food production, on global food security? And I want to introduce to you a globetrotter, Karen Wilholt from Denmark originally. She has, she has worked with the Danish Geological Survey. Um, she's also worked with the International Water Management Institute and been in Asia with that and is with in South Africa now on a mission in South Africa. She's working with hydrologic communities around the world and she's going to speak on that connection between this groundwater pumping for irrigation and food security. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you for inviting me for this uh, very exciting conference. I really appreciate it, and it's uh, very, very interesting. Um, so going on more or less from, from what we heard from Petra regarding global uh, assessments of um, the, the nexus between groundwater and um, uh, food production, um, I will focus more on the, on the food uh, aspects. Um, I will actually also be using some of the, the global uh, hydrological uh, model results, not uh, Petra's results, but very similar results. So the objective of, uh, of this work um, is to estimate the role of uh, groundwater in global food production um, at the global level and also look at it more distributed. Um, and it's also to then uh, narrow in on the particular part that relates to uh, depletion of groundwater. So looking at how much of the global food production is actually derived from uh, depleting groundwater, unsustainable groundwater use. Um, and then also something that has not been looked at uh, previously, I think, is, is looking um, at uh, different crops and, and how um, the various crops uh, contribute um, or, or are derived from groundwater depletion. Um, and uh, finally, sort of provide some pointers uh, for policy. Um, I should actually go back and just say that this work is uh, work done by uh, IMI and uh, IFPRI, and I think I have a co-driver in the room, Aditya. <laughs> I'm sure he will help if I get stuck on some very technical issues. Thank you. Um, so just to uh, give you a little bit of a background and the starting point for our work, uh, which is actually now in uh, review with uh, Nature Communications, but it has not been published yet. Um, some of the data that were out there in the literature were very um, vague and not um, giving any details of the way that they were assessed. Um, so they were just given as a, as a statement and, and no back, there was no background data to support it. So I think uh, with our data, we are at least trying to describe uh, more specifically how we're doing it and, and, and how we came up with the results. And, and, and then we could also better justify and compare with these data that were given in the literature. So um, some overall data, 43% of all water used uh, for irrigation is coming from groundwater. That's not to, de to deal with the food, actually, but the last two points here deals with the food. So 10% of the world's agricultural food production depends on using mined groundwater. That's a World Water Commission report from 2000. And then 15% of India's food supply is produced by mining groundwater, and that's a World Bank uh, report from 2005. Um, so just a little bit of introduction. I think I can go through this quite uh, rapidly because uh, Petra was also mentioning some of these key data. So uh, about 70% of, um, of the water uh, or the groundwater in the world is being used in ir irrigation and for food production. And if you look at it uh, distributed at the global uh, level, you can see that there's quite a close uh, correlation uh, between where groundwater is abstracted and where <clears throat> uh, the irrigation uh, of groundwater happens. So that's basically saying a lot of the groundwater is used indeed for irrigation. But it's also uh, interesting to look then um, and compare those areas with where uh, the renewability of groundwater is happening. And basically this tells us that where groundwater is used the most is where it's least uh, renewed. And that's in a way very logical because that's where uh, you can grow a lot of food in these areas. They have a nice climate and so on. 
uh, but they are arid or semi-arid, um, and they don't, don't um, there's not much rainfall to replenish the aquifers. And so in these areas, that's where you have the inbuilt problems of, uh, or risks of uh, groundwater depletion. But that's also many times uh, the food baskets of the world. You can see that, and we talked about it earlier during the conference. Um, so if these resources run out uh, and we don't take care of it, then we are in deep problem. And we can see these, uh, these, this context around the world, so it looks very lush and green, but it's actually a hidden drought because we are emptying the subsurface uh, reservoir of water and uh, we are running out, basically. And this is what we see. You know, we have to go back to um, rain-fed agriculture if groundwater runs out. Um, we see increasing uh, conflicts with water supply for just uh, domestic uh, use, which is actually a very small fraction of water that is needed for that, but if the water is not there, it's a huge problem. And you also see environmental problems and um, infrastructure problems and so on. And also I want to fa uh, emphasize the fact that uh, what we term a groundwater drought, which is actually the, what we see also here in, in, in San Francisco, is, is, uh, is a thing that doesn't go away with the first rains. It's going to take many years to replenish those aquifers um, once the rain com comes back, um, if at all possible. Okay, so back to our study. We basically uh, used uh, three or four da data sets, global data sets, that we combined in a relatively simple, I would say, GIS analysis. Um, so the major information that we uh, used was um, looking at uh, a data set on food production uh, from the SPAM, um, which gives um, the food production in terms of areas uh, harvested and the food production. Um, it also looks at uh, food production from irrigation and non-irrigation. We looked at uh, what I mentioned earlier, the hydrogeological model results, which gives us information on groundwater abstraction and groundwater depletion. We also used information from FAO on uh, irrigated areas and in particular groundwater irrigated areas. And I refer to Petrodal again because it's also the, the same uh, global data set that we used. Um, and then we also looked at the distribution of uh, agricultural water use um, for, uh, uh, relative to total water use. And then the final product that we got out was food production and harvested area dependent on groundwater abstraction and also groundwater depletion. Uh, this was kind of a, a stepwise process. I'm not going to go into the details, but I can ex uh, come back to that if, if required. But with the all, overall question, how much food derives from groundwater and groundwater depletion? Uh, in, for the analysis, we, um, we, um, we work at the scale of um, five arc minutes. Um, and uh, actually the data for the, from the hydrogeological model was, as Petrodol also mentioned, at a half degree scale. So we had to downscale some of these results and sort of allocate uh, abstraction and um, groundwater depletion according to um, the irrigated areas and also the use uh, of the water. So there were some assumptions coming into the, to the picture. But finally, at the end, we aggregated these, uh, this uh, global distributed uh, data set into regional uh, zones here. There's 10 of them. And also, um, because the data set related to the crops were given in uh, 40, uh, 43 different crop groups, you can see to the right, um, we did some um, aggregation and, and, and uh, combined this into nine major crop groups. So that's what you will see the results coming out. So um, the, some of the key findings, sort of overall figures, uh, and the first one is more or less just to verify that uh, what we got out was uh, relatively consistent with what other people have found. So we found that 41% um, of, the, of the global irrigated area um, was uh, coming from um, from groundwater, about uh, 83.1 million hectares. And uh, that compares to, f yeah, th these data are from 2005. I should have mentioned that. Um, so we think this is pretty um, consistent with other people's results. We also found that um, 
Of the groundwater irrigated areas, 15.5 to 18.5 percent are supplied by depleting aquifers. And um, the depletion rate, we could also calculate that um, in agriculture, and that was about 129 uh, cubic kilometers per year, and that accounts for about almost 80 percent of the total groundwater depletion. Um, if we then look at the, uh, the sort of contribution uh, to uh, global food production, then the first row is just looking at how much of the food production is coming from groundwater. Um, and so 43.5% uh, um, of the food production uh, is coming from groundwater, uh, or from the irrigated food production is coming from groundwater. And if you compare to the total food production, which includes also the rain fed, then about 13% of the global food production is coming from groundwater. If you then drill down to the depleted fraction, then about 15.5% uh, of, um, of the groundwater um, derived food production is, is, is coming from depleted uh, groundwater. If you take it as a fraction of the irrigation, the total irrigated uh, food production, it's about 7%. And if you look at it in, in relation to the total food production globally, then uh, about 2% of the global food production is coming from groundwater depletion. Now some figures um, on the regional distribution. You can see the regions uh, to the left. I'm not going to go through all the, uh, all the figures, but just point out a few of them. And uh, what I show here is the um, contribution of the different um, regions to the total uh, groundwater depleted uh, food production. And you can see that East Asia, the OECD, and uh, South Asia are the three regions that uh, are contributing most to the, to the global food production from groundwater depletion. If you look at it uh, relatively, in the last, uh, second to last column, you can see again this point, 6.7% um, that I showed in the previous graph. But if you then compare different uh, regions, you can see that some of the regions, they, ha they rely even more heavily on groundwater depletion for their food production. So in, um, in South Asia, it's up to 10% of all the food production uh, in irrigation that is coming from groundwater depletion. And similar figures for... Um, uh, the Near East or um, uh, North Africa region, and also for the OECD. Then looking at the crop um, distribution, you have the crops to the left, and uh, similarly looking at the sort of uh, crops that mostly are, contribute or are, are grown by uh, groundwater depletion, those would be the cereals, uh, the roots and tubers, and the sugar crops. And they combine to... Uh, constitute, uh, how much is it, 70, 80, more than 80 percent of all the food crops that are grown by groundwater depletion is coming or is going to these crops. However, if you drill down a little more and you look at uh, some of the other crops, you can actually see and uh, you can compare those uh, figures to the right there with the bottom again, 6.7, and you can see that some of these smaller crops are preferentially grown by groundwater and also preferentially by uh, depleting groundwater. And those would be vegetables and fruits, uh, roots and tubers like potatoes, non-food crops like cotton, um, and legum leguminous crops. Uh, those have higher percentages that, than the average, showing that um, they, they are preferably uh, grown, or in many places they are grown by groundwater because groundwater is a very stable uh, resource, and, and these crops are high-value crops. So that's why farmers uh, like to grow them the, with the groundwater. I just uh, wanted to show a couple of uh, maps uh, at the end here, and that is to show the distribution of uh, the two major crops that are uh, grown by groundwater depletion. The first one here is uh, cereals, and you can see how it's distributed um, across the globe. So this shows um, the the tonnage of, of um, cereal produced by groundwater depletion. Um, and it's not surprising because it's very much coinciding with what we have seen by Petra and, and earlier also by me, where uh, the groundwater depletion is happening. Um, but it's interesting to look at the figures also. So if we sum up for some of these countries, we can see that, um, for instance, 33.6% uh, of the cereals um, produced by uh, groundwater depletion is coming from India and Pakistan. 
more than that, 39% is coming from China and 14% of the, all the cereals produced by groundwater depletion is coming from, from the USA. If we look at the same uh, map, but for uh, sugar crops, oh, sorry. This is, this is one here. I, you can see that there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a bias here. So a lot of the sugar produced by groundwater depletion is happening in the South Asia. And 78% uh, is actually coming from uh, production in uh, India and Pakistan. And I think that's, that's kind, uh, dis kind of disturbing that we're growing sugar, which is not a very, uh, very healthy necessarily or, or, or f uh, health uh, 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 required crops. And they are grown in, in these um, poor countries. I think that's very um, surprising and interesting to see. And, and it should uh, give rise to some, some policies, I think, that we shouldn't be growing so much um, uh, food from, uh, uh, yeah, from depleted groundwater and, and foods that are not really um, actually um, supporting food security as such. Okay, so uh, going into my conclusions, uh, global food production depends on depleting groundwater for 2% of total, 6.7% of irrigated, and 15.4% of groundwater irrigated fractions in 2005. And reliance on unsustainable groundwater for increasing uh, parts of global food production requires urgent attention. I think that's, that's my key message here. And solutions to be found in broader global food policies and interventions in both developing and developed part of the world. So I think also the develop, even, a lot, even though a lot of this uh, unsustainable food production is happening in the developed, uh, developing countries, we also have a big uh, share in this by looking at our consumer patterns and so on. We were just mentioning that earlier. And it's something that I think needs much more attention and, and analysis as well uh, and, and building on some of these results. So I think that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, both of you for an excellent overview. I'm here. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> and I'm also very proud to have Petra and uh, both of them on the stage because I think Petra took the first modeling class from me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I think she, uh, I, I was with her when we did her first field work and she also worked with me in Colorado. So I think this question a little bit has to do with more detailed questions, but I think because my work as is in, the, I'm looking at more fundamental scale physics and then, so the issue is that uh, this is related to the grace question. So when you, when you try to downscale this information, so we are looking at the larger systems at the global scale using models which are parameterized for those scales. So if I want to develop management scheme at a local scale, how do we use this information to make decisions on more, more regional or local, local management? Now this question for both of you. Mm. Yeah, that's, as, as we have already mentioned, there are some uncertainties related to, uh, to these data. And so if you want to zoom in on particular countries and, and so on, um, there might be even more uncertainty. So I think if you, if you want to drill down, you would have to get more uh, localized data. You'd have to uh, calibrate and, and, and you know, uh, compare these data before you could uh, trust them. We actually did, um, as you could see, we did um, calculate all the figures uh, at the country level as well. And I compared with other um, reports and, 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 and data from the literature. And, and our data don't seem to be too much of, you know, like on figures uh, related to groundwater abstraction, groundwater depletion, and so on, which gives me some sort of um, faith that when we then translate it into food production, it's also somewhat um, reliable, even though there's nothing really to compare with in, in this regard. More questions in the back? Thank you for a great presentation. I was wondering if in your studies, have you also looked at normalizing and reporting the data in terms of per person uh, that has an impact? And also, uh, I may have missed it, you may have talked about it, as well as a factor of availability of groundwater versus surface water, mm. how it impacts it. Um, no, we haven't uh, done uh, those kind of analysis. 
We've also been asked if we have looked at the value of the food, you know, not just the kilograms, but actually the value, and that might even raise the issue to a higher level because many of the crops, as I, as I mentioned, are of the high-value crops and also the very nutritious crops like vegetables and so on, they are grown by groundwater. So the, the value is actually even more important, I think. More questions? Maybe one more? Maybe up. Okay. Thanks for a great presentation. I was wondering if you have any suggestions for policy that could be put in place um, I know it's probably hard at a, you know, international scale, but, mm. you know, if, for instance, India, you know, if you were to go to the Ministry of Water or Agriculture, do you have any recommendations for them? Yeah, like I mentioned, the, the issue of, of growing crops that are not really supporting food security as such, like sugar crops and so on, I think that's something that you could spin a story about and, and actually bring out as a good example. Um, and you could uh, shift those crops to other areas or try to cut them down and, and produce more healthy crops. Um, so yeah, I think there's scope for, for further looking at this data set and see how it could produce um, sensible policy uh, recommendations um, at, the, at the national or even international level. We haven't had the time really to go into these discussions, but I think, I think with this, it, it should be possible and it's, it's very um, relevant to do that, and I would be happy to discuss with anybody after this if there are any further uh, ideas or suggestions.